Um, yeah, first, yeah, thank you to um, the Stanford Blockchain Collective for hosting us, um, Vince. And also, yeah, thank you to Christian for organizing this meetup for several years. Now, so um, time's limited, so I might be having to go through the slides quickly because I've, I've got a lot of slides here. So again, this, um, this is Ethereum Coding 101, so I expect people to already be, you know, have familiarity with programming. So that's the, that's the audience there. And before I get into code, there's a lot of code samples and things like that. But, you know, I want to give you some general idea first about the tech stack. So explain some analogies there. And also, um, first, you know, why even bother, you know, why even bother, you know, learning something new? You know, what are some of the potential benefits? And then it'll be, you know, some Ethereum quirks and tips where we'll actually see code there. Okay, so, so in the... So here's basically what I described. We'll go through a tech stack and then decentralized applications and their benefits, and then invoking smart contracts, quirks, and tips. Okay, so the tech stack of Ethereum, um, analogies are, you know, they're not 100% accurate all the time, but, you know, they're still helpful for you to get a general idea, right? So if I told you, like, web3.javascript in Ethereum is like jQuery, you know, you kind of get a little bit of an idea what that, that might be like. So in typical... Typical programming, we have the client and the server, and then the front end and the back end. So this is how I'm going to go through it. Um, and you need to have a basic um, view of the blockchain, and basically, and explain like I'm five of the blockchain, is it's a global database that everyone has a copy of, and it's rules for updating the database. It does help to know a little bit about um, blockchains a little bit more, especially at the end, because I'm not going to be able to explain too much, but I think you can get still a lot of value from the talk. So for the front end, so we're going to start at the, at the front end, okay? And then, you know, make our way down through the stack, right? So in the front end, your technology is the same, whether you use HTML, JavaScript, CSS, or, you know, Java.net, or Qt, or Swift and Objective-C. So that's the same. Now, between connecting your front end and your back end, in Ethereum, there's no standard word for it, but I, someone um, used this word connectors, and I think it's a pretty reasonable one. And so this is where, yeah, one of the main connectors is web3.javascript, and again, that's like jQuery. And I, I have included a lot of references in my slides. If you want the slides, it's again at tinyurl.com slash ethereum coding 101. So ethereum coding 101. And, and the connectors, the underlying uh, protocol underlying the connectors is JSON RPC. So JSON RPC, you know, you can think of that as kind of like Ajax. Now, where is the server in these um, Ethereum applications? So, in Ethereum, it's a network where each um, the network is comp comprised of nodes. You'll see in the literature as well that you know you can call them clients, Ethereum clients. But I don't want to confuse you between the old client server and this thing. So that's why I'm going to always use the term node. Okay. So the peer-to-peer -peer network replaces the server. And now the, the nodes that you can run, you can run a variety of them. Two of the popular ones are written in Go and in Rust. There's some Go Ethereum, also called Geth, and Parity, which is written in Rust. And there are other nodes written in C++, Python, Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum J is the Java one. There's a .NET. JavaScript libraries there. And the database under the nodes, if, for people who are interested, Geth uses LevelDB, Parity uses RocksDB. And the connectors, they provide an easy common interface to the blockchain so that you don't have to, you don't have to uh, figure out the LevelDB APIs or the RocksDB APIs. You can just use Web3 JavaScript or JSON RPC and get the information from the blockchain. So. Okay, so where's the back end again? So the smart contract is the equivalent to your back end code. And one of the popular languages for writing smart contracts is Solidity. So that's just like, you know, PHP, Ruby, equivalent like that. So there are other smart contract programming languages, Viper, all these LLL serpents, an older one. Uh, here's Viper. Vi we're going to be um, talking about Solidity. Viper is a newer development, and just a quick word about it. Viper has been 
being built so that it's natural to build secure co contracts, a more natural way to build secure contracts. And the language in compiler is more simple and auditability, so it's very difficult to write misleading code. Now, Lisp, um, there's a low-level Lisp-like language here. I'm going to go through these slides just faster, but they're in for the reference there, because I have around 90 slides here. So here's information about Solidity. And here we have Remix. So Remix, you can think of it as like your JS Fiddle, where you can try out things. Sorry, Joseph. Yes. Does anybody want to have a Joseph use a mic? Would you, right on the, on the podium there, apparently there's a mic. Just pick it up. OK, is this one working? Oh, wait. Is there a mobile mic? Thanks. Uh, I can try it. Yeah, here. I'll just go like this. Great, great. OK, so, so Remix is like your, your JS fiddle, remixethereum.org. And now, just some quick things about why you might even spend time learning these new things, because you'll see that there's some odd things here, and you know, why would you want to bother with it? So Ethereum is a platform for decentralized applications and systems. And it's kind of like a world computer where things um, are in agreement, consensus. Now, what is a decentralized application? It's an application that's connected to the Ethereum blockchain and the peer-to-peer -peer network running code on the Ethereum virtual machine. So a smart contract is a program on the Ethereum blockchain, and it is executed by the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. Now, what are some of the benefits here? Uh, one is its vertical computing. Honest, I'll give some examples of that. All nodes implement the same rules, and there's a specification here called the yellow paper that has precise definitions on the rules. So the other benefits are it's tamper-proof, no single point of failure, and autonomous code. So it's um, if you're trying to figure out you know, what are the, be the values of decentralized applications as well, I, I'm just pointing to this example here about the internet because, and my summary here is it, it's often not possible to predict human creativity, innovation, and technological progress. So vertical computing is honest computing. So some, some of, if you look at these examples here that I give, you can think of it as why, um, why you know, are, how honest are they? So when you go to an e-commerce or a travel site, could they be charging you different prices depending on you know, when, when you're logging in or they see that you're looking at the same item, things like that. Um, or if you're playing some game like poker, poker online, you know, is, is it really honest or there, you know, is the back end the server cheating against you, telling other people your cards, things like that. Or even simple things like polls or voting. So if you're on a Reddit or something and you see something has 100 upvotes, can you really trust it. Someone says there were 100 votes, but could someone just have updated a database entry? So another benefit is um, it's tamper-proof. So if you know a little bit about um, Bitcoin or blockchains already, no one but the holder of private key can make statements or actions about an account. So again, this is pretty powerful because, you know, when, if you log into any other site, again, they could just pretend, um, you know, they could say that you like cats when you really don't like cats. And unless you, you, know, you keep your profile, keep a close eye on it, you, know, you might see that things there that you didn't really do. Uh, it's tamper-proof, so code of smart contracts cannot be changed to run other code. And then there's no single point of failure. Hacking or shutting down n nodes does not affect the rest of the nodes connected to the network. So to basically shut it down, you have to you know, really shut down the whole, every single node out there. And there's no single point of failure. So the Ethereum name service, this is a site and it's a step to a decentralized DNS. And autonomous code, this is, um, the way I describe it is code, it's really in the cloud because once you've deployed your code, it's always there. And, you know, AWS is not really the cloud because it's all uh, controlled by Amazon. So the ideal case, here's another ideal case of autonomous code and one that I like, is that there will be no, really no need for operations and DevOps, because once you deploy your code to this peer-to-peer -peer network, 
it just runs there. You don't need servers, you don't need patching, you don't need upgrading, monitoring, alerting. You might still want some of those things, but basically it's, um, yeah, you, you get relieved a lot. So now here are some, some code here. Let's start seeing some code. This is about Silty 04.15 here. So we're gonna pretend we're in a console. There's a few consoles. There's a Truffle console that I've um, put a link here. Uh, the other con nodes also have consoles. So Geth has a console, Parity has a console. And now let's get into some code. So if you're in JavaScript, here's a very simple JavaScript function. Right, foo, e, turn e plus one. If you call foo of seven, of course, you're gonna get an eight. And now, how do we make that into Silty? Now, you're gonna have to take a look at the um, bold parts here. So, you can see that I put in um, uint. Basically, Silty is statically typed. So, this is where you add extra bits, and this is becoming to look more like solid solidity. So, the the input to foo is now, you're giving it a type of an unsigned integer, and you're also saying that it's returning an unsigned integer. Okay. And then to wrap things up, you always have to wrap it, um, the functions belong inside a contract, you know, a little bit like how Java, you know, all methods are, are in some kind of class. So there, this is already a smart contract that you can put in Remix and you can run it. And here are some additional steps though when you're interacting with it in your console that, that you need to do because, um, so we're using this web, web3.js library to get this bar contract object. And then you have to point at an address and then we have Barry here which is an instance of the bar contract. So here's um, bar, right? B Barry is an instance of it. And like, this is just to keep things consistent here. Okay, so the, yeah, basically the ABI application binary interface sets up Barry to have the functions. It's a deeper and important topic. Maybe it will be one of the future talks that I might give. But here now, so now when we have this um, Barry instance, Right, if we have this code here and we call barry.foo7, okay, things are already going to start to get a little weird if you're not careful because you would expect that it is eight, but if in your console, you're going to get some hexadecimal value back. And that's one of the, and that is a 32 byte transaction hash. And I'll show you how you can get, you know, your expected results. But already, part of this talk is, you know, I don't want you to start um, programming with this and then already you're trying to run some code and already you're puzzled, hey, why isn't this returning me eight? I mean, doesn't it look so simple and shouldn't just return an eight? So, so there's two options for a quick fix. The first one is you can label the function constant and, or the second one is you can use an explicit call. So I'll go through both of these. So the first easy fix is you just add constant where I've added it in bold there, just before the return type. So now if you add that, and now in your console you do the same thing, Barry foo of seven, then you will get eight as you expect. Now for the second alternative, the second alternative is you don't change the code, but you change the way you invoke it in your console. And this is where, instead of Barry foo 7 you do Barry foo dot call 7 And with that, then you will get 8 bit as you expect. And using an explicit call or invoking a constant function will not submit anything to the peer-to-peer -peer network. So the Ethereum virtual machine has very limited access to the underlying database. It has no access to transactions. And contracts by default only have access to its own storage. So yeah, a read-only function doesn't change or, or write to storage. So if you see here, in this function, all it's doing is it's just taking its input and then returning one more than its input. So nothing is stored, 
there are zero state changes. Now, we're going to change this contract a little bit so that we do write to contract storage. So the first thing that I've done is I've declared a, a variable here, last e, which is an unsigned integer. And so now this is the, the, a storage variable of the contract. And now in foo, we, we say that we want to remember what was the input passed to foo. So that's the, those are the changes that I made there. Now, because we used um, in Solidity, because we said that the last E was also a public, Solidity will automatically generate a function called last E, which is like your getter. So if you want to read the value of last E, you can just call last E. So now if you, if in our example here, if we marked foo as constant, Okay, but this is the modified example already. Okay, so foo, we're storing last e, and you know we're returning e plus one. Now, if we do if we do marry foo of seven, right, we're going to get the correct result here, which is eight. But if we call um, last e of Barry, we we are going to get a zero there when we're expecting a seven. And and that's because we've said that foo is marked constant and it's not going to be updating the, the state. And similarly, if we um, use Barry Foo call 7, again, we'll get the correct value 8, but Barry last E will still be 0. So this is where I'm knowing a little bit how about blockchain will help a little bit. I'm just going to have to give this ex explanation for people already know. but. Um, so a write, a write in the blockchain only happens when the transaction gets mined. And so the process is when we call Barry Foo of seven, this is why we get this hexadecimal, you know, 32 byte transaction hash. And then later when that transaction is mined, then when we call last E, that's when we will get the correct result of seven. I'll, I'll keep continuing, and we'll take uh, questions at, at the end if anyone has. So miners yeah, collect transactions into a block, and then the winning miner gets their block appended to the blockchain. So this is what, this is what happened here when, when a winning miner does not include a transaction in the block. So the last E variable, it starts at 0. And then when a transaction setting last E to 7 is submitted to the network, if the winning miner is M, and they don't include the block, then last E will still be zero. It's only when, when that transaction gets included in a block that last E will be updated to seven. Okay, so miner M did not include it, so that's why when you call them last E, it'll still be zero. But you know, another miner comes along, picks up the transaction, stores seven to last E, which stores last, and then, so the winning miner is x, so now last is 7. So writing to the blockchain is done with transactions. Writing is a, asynchronous, because you'll never know when a miner is going to actually add your transaction to a block. Now, here's another um, uh, difference that, will, that, that can be tricky to, to follow initially. So on, on the front end, on your front end, you can only get a transaction hash back. And, but front ends can get event data later. So, so on your front, front end, you're trying to get what the value of last E is. You're, you'll never be able to, to do it unless you use an event. And to use an event, I've added these parts in bold. So you would say, um, you'd, you'd give your event a name. I've re called it foo returned and then whatever um, value you, you want. And then here you can see that um, I do full returned E plus one. And so this is a way that the front end can then get that value. And there's a lot of um, yeah, documentation about, about events and something that I, I wrote here, but don't have time to go, go into this here. So contracts, so the front end can get events, but contracts 
cannot. Okay, so contracts can get the return values, but they cannot get events. So I'm going to try to summarize this in the, definitely in a conclusion. So basically, yeah, contracts can get the return values, but they cannot get events. And then on the front end, front ends cannot get return values, but they can get events. So here, so you've already seen um, quirks from your typical programming, right? There's two two ways to invoke a function. You can use a call or a transaction. And if you use a, um, the, the first one, it's a read-only and it's simulated call. And if you want to write to the blockchain, you have to use a transaction. And this is what um, I just mentioned a little bit before already. On, on the front end, you cannot get transaction return values. You need to filter and listen for events. But contracts cannot get, get events. So, okay, this is, uh, we've gone through this one. Now, so, some other um, tips here. So every invo invocation when you're calling a smart contract, you need a transaction object. And if you think of it in JSON terms, it looks like this. It's got four properties from, to, gas limit, value. So transaction objects can have default values. So when, when you call down Barry Fu of seven, it actually was using a transaction object with default values. And Truffle, which is the console that we were using, it helped set up some, some default values there. And to, to run code in the EVM, you need, to, um, you need fuel. This is gas, it's a pretty big topic. Some references here. A brief note about gas is there's one of the confusing things about it is because there's different um, number of different words that are all sound similar but have important differences. So the gas limit is sometimes called gas or start gas if you start reading through some of the documentation. So if you ever see gas or start gas, that's the gas limit. Now the gas price is very different to the gas limit. And if you are adjusting the, the gas price, that's the one that you have to be careful about because that's the one that will actually generally lead to more um, money that you spend. So if default values are missing from or incorrect in your transaction object, it will have an error. The invocation will have an error. So if, let's say we called Barry Fu 7, but our transaction object had an undefined from, this is, you'll probably get an error message in your client saying something like account does not exist. So if you're running some, if you're making an invocation and in either get console or some other one, you get an error message account does not exist, you want to check, just check the value of your from. Uh, there's two ways that I'm mentioning how to quickly fix this one. So you can specify your from explicitly. So here I just said, okay, it's from, from beef here. Or you can use this, um, you can set a default account, set it to beef, and then now it's always going to use um, that default account if it's not overridden. So the default account is quick and dirty, but it's safest to explicitly just specify your from. And if the from is wrong, it's, which is possible to do because sometimes you're using multiple accounts, then you may get this error message, message saying the, the account may need to be unlocked. So then you want to just check, are you actually using the, the account that you expect? So maybe you, you, you forgot and you're using the wrong account. Or if you are using the right account, then you, then you just need to unlock you know, the beef account here. Another, another error is when you get an error about insufficient balance and you're, you're sure that you're using the right account. This, this can especially apply, let's say, if you, um, if you have an account and you have some tokens in it and you're trying to transfer uh, those, those tokens, then you, you do need some, some, some ether already to be able to transfer some tokens. So 
if you get you know insufficient balance, then this beef account needs some some ether. So tra transaction errors. There's there's I guess two kinds. You know issues. If you have a problem with your from account, that, that's static and upfront error. Your you'll be told straight away. You know hey you don't have enough balance or hey, you haven't unlocked your account. But runtime errors can be much more puzzling when you're, un when you're assured that your code is correct. And the most, one of the most common ways is out of guess. When your code is correct and you're trying to see, hey, why isn't my storage val variable getting updated? A lot of times it could be because you're out of guess. And when not enough gas is provided in a transaction, all its state changes will be reverted. And this is why you're trying to, you know, update some variable in your contract, and you, and you're pretty sure that your the logic of your contract is all correct. But if you run out of gas, then that's probably the reason why it's not happening. So how can you tell if you're out of gas? You can use a block explorer. That's one way. In EtherScan, it would give you this. Uh, they they would tell you you have this warning here: error encountered, out of gas. Or another one, if you want to check to see if your transaction is reverted, is you want to check the receipt status. And using the Web3 library, you would call get transaction receipt. Web3.eth.get transaction receipt. And if you see zero, that means that you, your transaction got reverted. One means success. And if you're looking through blockchain history before this 4.6, um, before 4.67 million block, the status will be now. There was because this uh, this was just updated after block that block number. Now, now if you want to find out if you're out of gas, you can check if the receipt, the transaction receipt, look at the gas used property. So if you check if gas used equals the transaction's gas limit and it's, the status is zero. And yes, it's a similar thing that I have here. So if you, oh, to fix the out of gas issue, this is where in your transaction object, you just have to specify a higher gas limit. So I gave an example here, bumping up the gas limit to 299,000. <coughs> And to conclude here, uh, so what are some of the, be the benefits? It's vertical computing, honest, it's tamper-proof, and then no single point of failure, and uh, it's autonomous code. And so for, for front ends, it's just a, your usual technology. On your back end, you have smart contracts, things like Solity and the Ethereum virtual machine, and then you have connectors, Web3 JavaScript, JSON RPC. The, the nodes form a peer-to-peer -peer network. They replace requests to the servers. Everyone running a node is basically a server. And there's two types of invocations, a call and a transaction. The one is um, you, it's a read-only simulated call. And if you're writing to the blockchain, you have to use a transaction. <coughs> and in the front end, you cannot get transaction return values. You'll only be able to you'll need to use filtering and listening for events. And on contracts, you can get your return values, but you cannot access events. <coughs> so every invocation needs to provide enough gas. If a transaction isn't working, you have to check if it has enough gas and try increasing the gas limit. And here, here are references. And yeah, I guess any, I can take some questions. What kind of events are there? Oh, oh, the kind of events that are there. So if you saw, you have to define it yourself. So events can take um, yeah, a number of parameters. You can even have events that don't take any parameters. And then you can, um, in your UI or front end, you can filter and listen for those. So events, are they related to transactions? And, and what are some of the typical uses of events? Um, are events really? So, so events is, uh, is a way yeah, for a transaction to kind of like communicate with your front end or your, your user interface. And then some common events that you were asking, right? So 
So, um, so, so events, you know, you can, you can use it. So let's say you wanted your, your user interface to get the value like I had of E plus one. You know, that, that's one way. Uh, if you want, you know, things like analytics, I think that would be another way that you would, you would use events. If you ever want to communicate something to your user, you know, like if you want to communicate some message or something, then when something happens in your smart contract, then that's when you would use, use an event. So it's basically a, the bridge between, you know, the blockchain and your user interface. Uh, okay. Yeah, over there um, first. Going on events. So with your JavaScript code that's connected with Web3, be receiving that event? Is that where it's caught? Um, so, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, your, yeah, your, your UI and your front end would be receiving that, that event. The way it would work is, yeah, this web, let's say you, you're using the connector web3 JavaScript library, right? That is, um, yeah, that, that is connected to some kind of node that you're running. Whether you're running it or you're running, uh, or you can connect to some node like Infura, then they're the ones that are, um, when something happens on the blockchain, they're the ones that, that uh, get it first. But then since your JavaScript is uh, connected to it, it will, your JavaScript will also get that like call back. Uh, just one a little bit far back. Maybe far back. Uh, no, yeah, you there. Uh, OK, you, you and then the guy behind you there. OK, go. So the trustworthiness of a transaction depends on the number of confirmations in the blockchain. So um, do I get an event for every confirmation, for example? Or ask differently, is the amount of trust that um, I want my data to have dependent on the smart contract? So for example, would the smart contract say um, a certain data value has to be confirmed five times or 10 times? OK. so. Yeah, I got the two questions. So the first question is, um, yeah, to get, yeah, to, to to get security, you want your transaction to have a number of confirmations. Yeah, that's right. Just similar to like Bitcoin, you do want um, to wait for a number of transactions. So one way that um, yeah people actually do it, and so far it's the the main way that that still seems to only be there, is you have to um, keep calling that get transaction receipt in a loop. You know, maybe every second or something, and then, and then, you know, then you will see when your transaction gets mined, and then you can also then um, check check things for like what the block number is. But it's up to the smart contract to decide the level of. of yes. So yeah. So with your second, with your second question, it was something like, can a smart contract determine um, like how many confirmations? before accepting some value, something like that? For example, so for example, um, a smart contract that uh, where not a high level of trust is involved, it may be sufficient if the data is just confirmed once or twice, but for some other smart contracts that require a high level of trust, uh, the contract uh, may only trust the data if it's confirmed 10 times, for example. Yeah, so... Yeah, so, so in, that, in, in that example, so the example was, um, yeah, sometimes a smart contract might want to only accept data after 10 confirmations, something like that. So this, so smart contracts will, you know, they get the data straight away. If you want extra, an extra um, functionality like that, like you are describing, you would need to program that in your smart contract. So your smart contract could keep track of um, the, the block number when the value was initially written. And then, you know, it has access, the smart contract has access to the current block number. So it can always then check, hey, is um, my current block number, you know, greater than last block number plus 10. And then it can operate that way. Okay. okay. Uh, actually, did you miss the guy at the back? Oh, oh, yeah, 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 that's right. Sorry. Uh, it might be related to your previous question, but okay. um, you mentioned that uh, if a miner uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't record the transaction, 
then it never gets uh, written to the block. If, it, if a miner doesn't acknowledge or record a transaction, then it doesn't get yeah. written Yes. How, but does, how do you guarantee that a transaction is, is written to the block? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, w this is a general blockchain question. So, yes, tra transactions only um, count, you know, when a miner yeah, includes it in a block. And the question is, yeah, what are the guarantees that a transaction will, will get added to a block? And this is, um, yeah, part of the game, game theory with blockchains. Uh, basically, a miner will get transaction fees, so that's one of their main incentives for including your transaction and and also um, if one miner you know for some reason doesn't want to right since it's decentralized other you know there are a whole lot of other miners that probably would want to include your transaction so there are some probabilistic things about the blockchain and also game theoretic and this is one of them uh, so two questions. First, like a smart contract, what if you have uh, updated a version for your smart contract? How are you going to update it to keep the contract, you know, the, to keep the trust uh, with the yeah. original bound, right? Yeah, so... so people use your smart contract because it, it, they trust your code. What if you, you update to a new version? How are you going to handle the, 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 the bound of trust? And second question is like a... It, when you mention the front end, uh, you mention mostly just the web front end or whatever. I'm developing an iOS app. I want to interact with the back end directly from my iOS app. How, how are we going to do that? Okay, so yeah, I'll, so there's two questions. I'll do the second one first. Um, the, the second question was, if, if you're writing an I, iOS app, how can you interact with the blockchain? So this is where, um, Instead of using, if you cannot use the web3.javascript connector, then you can use some other connector that implements the JSON RPC. So JSON RPC is just, um, yeah, it's a generic um, protocol, so other people can write um, iOS libraries that also implement it. So that's the one, that's what you would have to look into, J JSON RPC. And then for the first question, the first question is an important one about um, upgradability of smart contracts. So can you, um, there's a lot of things to be able to talk about um, upgradability of smart contracts. So I'll, I'll uh, mention some things and then if your question's not answered, we, we can uh, maybe go offline. So um, yeah, so when you program a smart contract, it's basically not upgradable unless you already have a whole lot of code in there that says you know it can be upgraded by certain addresses or under these conditions but obviously um, I'm not yeah some people like upgradable contracts a lot my opinion is it's um, best to try to avoid thinking that way it puts a lot of more pressure on getting things correct and testing a lot of rigorous process like that but um, but when, you're, wait, but when you do have an upgradable smart contract, right, if you, if you are able to upgrade it, then that means people have to trust you. So if you really want um, a trustless system, you can't have too many of those things. And making contracts upgradable, you have to write a whole lot of code. Again, makes it much more complicated. And I guess it's part of these things that you know, led, led to, to the, uh, the, the DAO. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Okay. Um, is there a, a, a concept of these, just like this contract that you have act, uh, a natural expiration date, and beyond that, if you want to, you, know, you can, you know, carry on the next uh, lease. So yeah. So you can, um, yeah, in your smart contract, yes, yeah, you could you could write some some code there that says that after some block number, you know, your contract can can be um, self-destructed. And when that happens, then yeah, any any other calls that it gets will just um, error out. Is that actually being used? Is that use, a useful concept to you? Um, so se yeah, self so self destructing a contract can 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 be helpful, but um, it's you have to be um, much more careful with that because there, there's this other big incident 
about funds getting locked up because there was this library contract that got self-destructed. Guys, we're, 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 we hit our little boundary there. There's lots and lots of topics that could be covered um, that, that Joseph is a great wealth of information. Please talk with him afterwards. Uh, so because we have, we want to give you a chance to eat a little bit of pizza, which is outside, supplied by New Cipher. We want to give you time for that and also a time for a talk by McLean. So we're going we're gonna to break now. I, I wanted to uh, acknowledge the uh, IEEE Young Professionals. Do we have any of those here? Any IEEE members? None. Okay, that's fine. But at least they sent out the invitation. Okay, let's thank okay. Joseph. Thanks.